Hey everybody, it is Scott Steen with Winners and Winers Radio. Welcome to the Thursday edition of the show, Winners and Winers Radio. Give us an hour and we'll give you the winners. I am the lead handicapper over at winnersandwiners.com and I'm going to bring on my co-host and a partner. He is senior handicapper at Winners and Winers. He is Scott Reichel. Scotty, what's going on? Nothing much. Pretty crazy day in the NBA. You had a lot of news stories that broke. And then the only thing crazier than the news stories were arguably the games, but very, I'd say, eventful 24 hours in the NBA. And yeah, we're going to talk about a lot of it. It was, I think we're going to talk pretty much about all of it. Yeah, that was, it was a nutty day. It was a nutty day. It was a nutty night. A lot of craziness going on. I know that you did, you did well on your picks. I know that you said uh, you went 5-0 and on your leans, picks, locks, et cetera. Well, I know we said that some of them were going to age either well or horribly, depending on when uh, this show is actually going to air. And I believe everything we said in the early afternoon in baseball won. Yeah, we like, like literally the, every pick that we had won. We like I, we like the Tigers over the Royals at plus money again. We like the Tigers. We like the Mar. We like the uh, something in the Marlins game. We also yep. liked the Padres team total over, and that game flew over as well. Then even the nightcap games pretty much went the way we thought they would. With the exception of a couple of disagreements here in the NBA, we'll get to those. <laughs> yeah, it was it was a fun day. I know that it's always it's always a good day when when everything goes your your way, and uh, we're happy we're happy that it worked out that way. Pretty much, but I feel like we got to talk about some people who maybe didn't go their way yesterday. Yeah, let's do it. Let's start off the show as we always do, Scott. We always like to get the bad news out of the way first and talk about the people that took the bad beats, the people that. You know, maybe thought they had winners, and then it didn't work out so well. In the end, you know, you know, we've all been there. You, you, have you been there, Scott? Ever? I have been. It's not fun. Is there anything anything you can do? I'd rather be in Vegas. All things considered, I'd rather be in Las Vegas. The only thing you can do, you can call your friends, you can whine about it, you can get on Twitter, but at the end of the day, you feel like you really want to call the cops. All right, that's a lot of co- that's a lot of cops out there, Scott. They are coming for us, and and indeed they should be here for this one. I think you mean an Embiid. They should be there for this. Oh, one. oh, I see what you did there. I, I mean, you see. walked right into that one. I had to. Speaking of Embiid, Scott, it's the 76ers minus seven. You looked good for the entire game. They were up 22 at halftime, 14 after the first quarter. How could you possibly lose this one? This would take a meltdown of monumental proportions. Led by 14 with six minutes left. Six minutes and 11 seconds left. They led by 14. You're counting your money. You're picking up stuff on Amazon. You're ready to pull the trigger. And then they went ice cold. Ice cold, Scott. They scored four points when it mattered. Basically, in the next six minutes, they did add a worthless bucket there at the end that meant absolutely nothing as they end up losing 109 to 104. Well, to go through the actual numbers. I'm sorry, 109, 106, right? It was 109, 106. But to go through the actual numbers, they got outscored 40 to 19 in the fourth quarter. They had four points in the final six minutes, including the worthless two. So for a five-minute, 59-second stretch, they had two points. Now, a fun stat uh, for some, maybe not for others. Do you know how many different players scored for the Sixers in the second half? Three. Two. Mm. Seth Curry and Embiid were the only two players who scored on the entire Sixers team in the second half. oof And they almost got away with it. They, they got away with it for three quarters. Of I'm sorry, who, who hit a field goal? Because Simmons made one out of every five free throws he took. So three Sixers actually scored. Two had actual made jump shots or made shots of any kind. And Embiid was what twelve for twelve when he went to the when he went to the line there with an, inside of a minute and missed them both. Yeah, he was, and then he missed the two at the right. end, which I feel like kind of went to uh, Capella's point. For some reason, Capella's actually a bigger trash talker than I ever knew he was going into the postseason. He made the comments about the Knicks, then he made the comments about Embiid, and he said, "Well, if Embiid gets tired, you can do whatever you want with him." And apparently, when he gets tired. A uh, great free throw shooter misses free throws. And I found out also Simmons is on pace to have the second worst free throw shooting postseason of all time 
with about a minimum of, I think it was 25 attempts or something like that. He's shooting below 30% from the foul line in the playoffs. And I'm going to say that the person he's going to beat is not Shaq. It is not Shaq. It is actually Ben Wallace. But a soon-to-be Hall of Famer, Ben Wallace. But anyway, I don't want to spend that much time on it. We'll get back to that choke job in a little bit. But looking at the second call of the cops, you do have baseball involving the Tigers and the Royals. If you had the under nine, you were in good shape early. Oh, Four yeah. runs through the first six innings, so you're definitely well on pace to get the job done. Then you had a little bit of an offensive outburst. You had eight runs going into the ninth. So four runs in the seventh and eighth, you know, could be better, could be worse, whatever. One run in the top of the ninth, so all of a sudden, you know, you're sweating out a push. And then uh, you weren't sweating it out for that much longer because Kansas City put you out of your misery, ended up scoring two meaningless runs, quote-unquote, in the bottom of the ninth. Game landed 6-5. to five. So you had seven runs in the final three innings to send that game over the total. Those bullpens are no bueno, my friend. Well, we knew the Tigers' bullpen was awful. The Royals have had flashes where they're decent at times. Yeah, they're, in, they're inconsistent. That's the best thing I'll say about the Royals' bullpen. Yeah. So, bad news from the Big Apple, Scott. Jacob deGrom made a start today. That's usually money in the bank, and it was. The Mets took care of business. But you had a prop on Jacob deGrom strikeouts at 10 and a half. Holy mackerel. Were you looking good? The uh, – First three innings, Scott, he recorded nine outs. Stick with me. It's going to get mathy. And in those nine outs, eight of them were strikeouts, Scott. So about that? He, he only faced nine batters. So it wasn't like the pitch count was getting up there. He nine up, nine down. So that's pretty impressive, right? Uh, he's on pace for 24 strikeouts. You've got to feel good. You've got to feel good about that 10 and a half. Maybe two more innings in your home, right? Uh, yeah, pretty much. At, at most, because the last two innings, he struck out the side. You assume minimum if you end up going to the sixth, he'll probably get there. But wait, Scott. In the fourth inning, uh, DeGrom's not coming out. What what gives? He uh, hurt his shoulder. Hurt his shoulder. That's right. That's right. He struck out eight in a row with an injured shoulder. He left after the third inning. He did not return. That's a bet. That counts. He made the start. You're locked in, and you are out of luck, my friend. If you had Jacob deGrom over 10 and a half, oof. That oh. reminds me of the Jokic rebound prop that we talked about the other day, where you're on pace for an easy winner. All you need is your guy to actually stay in the game. Yeah. And then with a lot of time left, your guy wasn't in the game anymore. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. Well, Scott, the opposite – of call the comps. It's the good news. It's the easy wins. It's the ones you didn't have to sweat. You could even kick back, take a little nap if you wanted to. These are the rocking chair wins. So the first one we're going to talk about in the rocking chair was kind of a deja vu game between the Marlins and the Cardinals. Shocker, a day later, they still can't score. If you had the under seven and a half again, it was very easy. Zero runs going into the ninth, zero runs going into the bottom of the ninth, and then the Cardinals walked it off again, this time via RBI single instead of a walk-off home run. Game ended one to nothing. So if you ended up watching that game and you had the under seven and a half, congrats on your bet, but I'm sorry you had to watch that because I'm sure that was very painful. I did watch that game. I uh, I love the I love to watch this this staff pitch. I love uh, Sandy Alcantara, but they just that offense is so bad with Miami. You know, you it's just awful. expect them to do just a little bit. They're they're the perfect combination, Scott. They're like the two thousand Baltimore Ravens. Fantastic defense. They don't let any runs or points in this in that case score, and uh, they don't score anything themselves on offense. It's shout out to Trent Dilfer. Yeah, shout out to Trent Dilfer, Super Bowl champion Trent Dilfer, by the way, Scott. So, there you go. Um, How about returning to baseball or staying in baseball if you had Baltimore-Cleveland over eight? Uh, This was kind of a no sweat. You had three runs in the first, thinking, hey, I'm pretty good shape. Nothing in the second. Uh, uh Uh-oh. Not to worry, my young friend, because they put up six runs in the third, including Cleveland putting up a five spot in bottom three. You add three to six, that gives you nine. And if you remember your equations from math, nine is greater than eight. So you had an easy winner as that one ended up eight, seven. No sweat at all for the over eight in the Baltimore-Cleveland game. 
And the last one was actually on the rink. It wasn't hockey, and it was actually my play today on the YouTube side. And I was on the right side of it. Had the Canadians plus one and a half goals taken on Vegas. That was around minus 120, minus 125, something in that ballpark. Canadians were up three to nothing in that game. So they were on cruise control. I was going to include the money line here for Montreal potentially, but Vegas made it a little bit dicey late, scored and ended up scoring two more goals to set it to three to two. Montreal held on and won. Definitely wasn't a sweat-free victory, though, for money line betters, but it got there. But if you had the reverse puck line, never in doubt, you're up 3 nothing in Vegas. In order for you to lose, needs to score five goals. They only scored two. Not, not, uh, not a great feeling by Vegas, although you did call that, Scott. You like Montreal to even the score there. And what did you call that team? The Montreal what? Canadians. You, you said it right. The Canadians? You, you, what? You know, you've been, no. You Canadians? Canadians. Canadians. There you go. Okay. That's actually kind of funny. I actually uh, re-watched my video just to actually kind of hear the logic on that. And I said that the score was going to be 3-2. to two. I said that Montreal was live to win the game. I said Carey Price would have 30 saves out of 32 shot attempts. He had 29 saves on 31 shots. Ouch. I was right there you on suck. the cusp. You the, suck. The trifecta. I was right there, but I was one shot off. That's a shame. Oh, uh, Scott. And how do you still have a day job? How is that even? I have no idea. Uh, it's, I mean, this I was, is your day it, job. It would have been so. one of the best predictions I've ever made in any video because I would have I would have gone three for three. Right. The actual outcome, the score, and the saves. But two out of three with some profit, I'll have to settle with money, I guess. I'll take one for the team. Yeah, and I don't want to. I don't want to give people the wrong impression. Like you have an actual day job. You don't. You know. You don't go down to Subway during the day and make sandwiches or anything. Your your day job is doing this. I'm just meaning besides betting. It has its perks. Absolutely. All right, Scott. We've got to talk about it. We saw an all time choke job on Tuesday night as uh, the Bucks gave away an 18 point lead there that they had in the second quarter. And he said, well, nothing could get worse than that, especially in the playoffs. And the Sixers said, hold my cheesesteak. Hold my cheesesteak. They went out and, like we mentioned before, blew a 22-point halftime lead with an epic fourth-quarter meltdown. So, Scott? They were also 26 in the third quarter, by the way. No, they did stretch it to 26. That's right. So, yeah, just – Put a little more salt in the wound there, no problem. Atlanta was roughly forty to one on the live money line at one point. Now, see, why don't you tell me a story about how you took that? I did not. I said on air I liked Atlanta to cover, but I didn't think it would. It wasn't exactly the way I drew it up. Let's we weren't on air during the middle of the third quarter either. Well, that is true. I said I liked Atlanta before the game uh, when we recorded uh, yesterday's show, and I also said I liked the under. They both hit. I, I didn't exactly want to say that I had Philly right where I wanted them when they were up 26 in the third quarter. <laughs> oh, my goodness. So, which choke job was worse? I, I think it's got to be the Sixers. I mean, at the end of the day, the Bucks one is really bad because, of course, the Nets only had Durant. Harden was a shell of himself. Jeff Green was great, but I think everyone knew that Durant had to beat you. But at the end of the day, it was still a road game. And you look at Philly – They've been one of the best home teams in the league for I don't even know how many years at this point, but they've been a consistently elite home team. And you're going into a situation where you just blew a 16-point lead in the third quarter the game prior. I would know because I had the Sixers in the game prior. Oh, yeah, Sixers minus three. I vaguely remember that as well. So uh, I believe we both had that. But anyway, the point is, is that you just saw this happen and your coach is Doc Rivers. So you know that the track record is there for you to blow leads of this caliber. And yet, they found a way to find a more embarrassing loss than the Bucks yesterday, and also their other uh, choke job that they lost for game four. The back-to-back just choked just from that one team. It has to be Rivers. I mean, there's no other explanation, right? I mean, even the series last year, the Clippers blew, what, three separate 15-plus uh, point leads in three straight games? How did, that, how did that meeting go there with the board at Philadelphia when they're getting ready to hire a new coach? They said, you know, who's the guy 
that always underachieved in L.A. with the Clippers. They, oh, you mean the guy who has the record for three blown three one series leads? Horrible, game, horrible but... meltdown last year. What the who? Who is it? Is it? Oh, Rivers. Let's let's see what that guy's doing. Is he? Think, is he got another he gig yet? School. I think he went to med school. <laughs> so, surprisingly, he was still available when the Sixers called. Is he one and done? If the Sixers dump this, are they, is he done? I definitely think they should consider it. I'm kind of is disappointed it? you didn't laugh at my doc joke for medical school, but good oh, enough. That was all right. That was okay. That was solid. Okay, cool. Just making sure that register. But anyway. They fly I, fast around here, my friend. I would say that if the Sixers and the Bucks both lose, Coach Bud's guaranteed to be fired. I think Doc maybe has a shot where they just look at the series and say, if Ben Simmons could actually shoot free throws, he would have won a couple more games. So maybe he's the scapegoat in the situation. There is no scapegoat for Milwaukee. It, it's just Budenhoser. I mean, that's just a given. But I was trying to think of the worst choke jobs I've ever experienced in basketball. And I don't mean just a series. I don't mean – I mean individual games. And I had the conclusion that – I made a list of three. I was trying to think of the top three. I didn't want to go that long because I didn't want to dig that deep. Right. You know what all three games had in common? Well, it's not gonna. It's it's not gonna be Doc Rivers. No, it was Doc Rivers. He was involved in all three games. He was involved in all three. He was involved in all three. However, they did win one of those three. So yeah, when you say you, when you say involved, that, that tells me that he was on the right side of, of one of them. Yeah, he was on the right side of one of them. But the other two were all time collapses. I'll go through the list. Uh, the third one I had was tonight with Philly, I think that's a bottom – I think that's one of the worst collapses in the history of basketball. That is an all-timer. You're Has at 26 at home. Like that's – two guys hit a shot in the second half? What, are you kidding me? Right. Like, that's, al- that's almost impossible. So, I'm putting that at three. Two, I have the uh, Clippers-Rockets game six from 2015, which was the Josh Smith-Corey Brewer game, where if the Clippers won that game at home – they would have advanced to the Western Conference Finals. Instead, they blew an 18-point lead with two minutes to go in the third quarter and then lost the series in seven. So that is my second uh, worst collapse of all time because James Harden was on the bench for that entire comeback Houston had. So that's pretty bad. But my number one, Rivers is on the right side of. He actually won the biggest choke job that I've ever seen. It was Golden State, I believe, in 2019 against the Clippers. They blew a 31-point lead at home with Curry, Klay Thompson, and Durant. And they lost to the Clippers in game two. How is that even possible? It's one of the greatest teams ever assembled. They lost to Toronto in the finals because Durant got hurt. But a 31-point lead with that, with one of the biggest or one of the best big threes of all time. So that's my number one choke job in basketball history. But Doc Rivers is on the sidelines for all three. That's very interesting. Just thought that was worth mentioning. And for those of you that are watching this on the YouTube, uh, drop a comment in there what you think was the worst one. If you, if you got one worse than that, uh, I'd like to hear it because those are three pretty bad ones right there. Yeah, but the, the point I'm trying to say is that Doc Rivers, I don't know what it is because I know he won a title. I still think he underachieved with those Celtics teams. I don't know if you can say that because they won a title, but don't you feel like that big three of KG, Paul Pierce, and Ray Allen probably should have won more than one? Yeah, yeah. And they were in the finals. They lost to Kobe, you know, whatever, but still. Right. It's just a situation where last year, I believe games five, six, and seven, they were up double digits in the second half and lost all three of those games. What, yep. what is it about some coaches where your team can only play well for about 30 minutes and then everything just hits the fan? Like, is there something that Doc Rivers can change about his philosophy or something? Like, I don't, I don't even get it. Well, you know, and the national narrative is going to be they, uh, they, they wilt under pressure. They don't have that killer instinct. They can't put them away, all that kind of stuff. I don't... But there's so many different players that have been involved in those Doc Rivers teams. Like, the, to, only, the only constant is the coach. To me, the, the, the difference, when you, when you talk about last night, or you talk about the last night versus Tuesday night, and to me, the difference is one of those was mostly self-inflicted, and that was the Sixers while the other one required an epic all-timer from KD. Yeah, I mean, he goes for 49, 17, and 10 
I'm not saying that Coach Bud is not to blame. We blamed him a lot yesterday. But sure. you'd at least have some excuse. Now, Trae did go for 39. But, I mean, come on, man. You were just watch. I don't know if you watched the game. Did you watch the uh, fourth quarter unfold? Uh, I, I, had, I had the fourth quarter on, yes. It was like watching a car crash in slow motion. You could see it from a mile away. And Doc Rivers did absolutely nothing besides cross his fingers and pray that his team suddenly, like, somehow held on. He made no adjustments in the entire fourth quarter. Well, you know, in fairness, he was up 14 with, with half the quarter gone. Yeah. Get so, Bible out of the game. He can't shoot. He kills your entire offensive spacing. But, is you it cool like, you, but you liked him for defense. I like him for defense, but is it a coincidence that he played 24 minutes, went two for two from the floor, had the worst plus minus on the team? He was minus 17. You can play four-on-five offense against Atlanta all you want with Tybo on the floor. So what do you like about him? If, he, if he's not going to play defense, he's not going to score. Tell us again why you like Tybo. Well, he's a body, but the point is that Danny Green, very, he's very – pretty tall. He's over six foot, I think. He's a, he's a good defensive player. I wanted to see more Corkmas. I thought Corkmas is actually good. I know they brought him back in in the fourth quarter, but it also doesn't help when Ben Simmons goes four for 14 from the line. Like, when they're intentionally fouling your point guard and you have a backcourt – I mentioned this the other day when they blew the last game. If your backcourt at any point in the fourth quarter is Ben Simmons and Tybal, who both can't shoot probably anything outside of 10 feet, your spacing is going to be absolutely atrocious. Has to be. And that's what Atlanta did. They clogged the middle, and they looked at everybody else besides Seth Curry and said, I dare you to beat me. And nobody could do it. Shout out to Seth Curry, by the way. 36 points. Shout out to him. Where do they go from here, Scott? Can, can, either, uh, one of these teams, can either one of these teams get off the mat? Uh, Philly preferably goes to game six in Atlanta, and we'll see what happens. But that was a joke. But uh, looking at the actual situation here, Philly's still the better team. But I also just don't know. We're going to talk they can, about they can put that on their They can put that on their fourth-place plaque. In the, in yeah, the, what I'm saying is that we know that they're the better team, but it also goes back to what we're going to talk about with the Bucks later against the Nets. I don't know how a team can just respond to such an awful choke job and act like nothing happened. I mean, you can talk about baseball, the Buckner play. That was game six. Right. Boston still came back for game seven. They were winning in game seven and then choked again. But the point is, is that – it's really almost impossible to just have the shooter mentality, quote unquote, of what just happened. I don't know. Like it just the short term memory. There's no way you can forget about that. It's an all time bad choke job. Right. Where do you think Philly goes from here? I have no idea. Yeah. I don't, I don't think know. it's rock bottom, but you blew back to back sixteen plus point leads in the second half. Well, we'll talk we'll talk about it tomorrow. I wanna I wanna kinda do a little uh, post mortem on that game. And well, I was kind of just segueing because we can talk about it with the Bucks later because we're going yeah, to Yeah, well, it. it's a similar well, situation. Well, let's talk about the let's talk about the West a little bit, Scott, because now all of a sudden the West is the West is in turmoil. It looks like, you know, the Clippers, they're going to they're going to have a shot at going home and taking care of business and they're going to face the Phoenix Suns who have arguably look like the best team in the playoffs, certainly the best team in the semis, would you agree with that? I think they're the, they've looked like the most consistent team throughout the playoffs. Well, here's the problem. Chris Paul is out with the in the COVID protocol. He's one of the most unlucky players in the history of sports. I'm telling you. Now we don't know. We don't know if he tested positive. We don't know if it's contract contact tracing. We don't know if he's had the vaccine. If he's had the vaccine, Scott, the protocol lasts a lot less time. I'm also confused how they don't know if Chris Paul's had the vaccine or not. Well, they probably do. They're just not telling us. I'm just saying. What What's the point in telling us if he has it or doesn't? They can just tell us. Like, well, then we you know start, he has COVID. No, like, you can't. You, yeah, I don't know. Where you start running into HIPAA violations there. Do you? I don't know. I, I don't know. But I, I know that. We disclose who has the virus. We know he has the virus. So we don't know that he. No, we don't know that he has the virus. Oh, oh sorry, because there could be some contact tracing. Correct. We know he's in protocol. That's it. Well, I did see, according to, I want to say it was, I don't remember who it was. Something, someone on Twitter who's verified with the NBA. Uh, said that they tested about 100 and whatever players in the league and one tested positive. So I don't think it was tracing. I think he might have it. Because I don't think that would really make sense because if it was tracing, then wouldn't the entire Suns team be in tracing because they were interacting with Chris Paul? 
It's weird how that works. That's not, that's not necessarily the case. I mean, because you can say the same thing. If he has it, why isn't the whole team in quarantine? Yeah, it's a fair point. I, I don't know. So it's the kind of – it's kind of weird how they do that. You know, the, the close proximity, if he was a roommate or whatever, it's – I'll be curious to see if any more information comes out. But let's say he can't make it. But we also don't know when that series would start because, of course, the Clippers did take a 3-2 lead yesterday. I, um, I don't know if Kawhi's going to play for game six. I'm sure Phoenix is praying that goes seven just to try to milk as much time as they possibly can before Chris Paul can potentially come back. How long would he be out if he was vaccine? I know without vaccine, it's about two weeks, and it's basically a lost cause. Depends on whether he showed up, whether symptoms showed up or not, whether he is okay. asymptomatic or whether he has symptoms. Okay. So here's the deal. It depends on what happens in the next game, of course, because it's the NBA and, you know, it's the NBA. So he starts, if they close it out in the next game, the series will start on the 20th, which would be a week, or excuse me, which would be Sunday. Yeah. And if it goes to game seven in the semis, they will start the 22nd, obviously, which would be the Tuesday. Yeah. So Phoenix is praying that the Utah wins game six. I think so. I think yeah. they you get that two extra days. It could be very, very important. So can you kind of, you kind of dodged the question there, buddy. Like, oh, the question I kind of interrupted you before you could ask it. You, are you they done? Are, are they done without him? I would say no. I don't think they're done because I don't think he'd miss the entire series. I think that he would come back mid-series, so maybe they can hold the fort. It's really tough. I think they could beat the Clippers because I don't really think Kawhi's coming back. He might. He's, he's certainly not coming back for the semis. That's what I'm saying, but it's, it seems like a knee sprain could be an ACL. Nobody really knows, but it's a lot of three-letter adjectives involving the knee, and those are never good. I've, so... I'm assuming it's Kawhi might not play at all in the Western Conference Finals. I think the Suns could beat them. If they play Utah, I think it would be very tough. Because Utah can stretch you out. They can shoot a bunch of threes. But we saw last night, if they miss a bunch of threes, late in the second, like second half, they're going to lose. Right. And Mitchell's also not 100%. So it seems like every team in the Western Conference, or even just the league in general, is just falling apart on the way to the finish line. And whoever's half left standing is going to win. It's like the end of Rocky Two, where like they're both stumbling, but Rocky gets up somewhat, and the ref just goes, "Close enough, you're the winner." Like that's kind of what's happening right now. And whoever can stay. Did you used to write movie reviews? Did I? Yeah. No, but I feel like I did. The the way you paint that picture, you just. Did I do? I feel like I did a pretty good job on that one. You you just summed up one of the greatest movies of all time into one line. I think I kind of had to, right, just at the ending because Rocky gets the glove raise and he immediately falls down again. The ref's just like – I mean, he was standing for like one second. We got to give it to him. Close but enough. anyway, that, that, that's the point I'm trying to make. So that's kind of the scene I'm getting from this actual matchup. I don't, think they're, I don't think they're done. I think that Phoenix just has a very, very solid group of guys. Of course, Chris Paul would help, and he would help a lot. But they still got Booker. They still got Aiton. They have some weapons of some kind. So, no, I don't think they're done. But realistically, they're done to win a title if Chris Paul's not going to come back. Okay. What do you think? I think it's going to be very, I think it's going to be very difficult. Of course, if they go on, I I don't even know who do you, I don't even know who they play in the East. Who's going to be, who's going to be, I mean, they play. uh, Nobody nobody knows. This is, yeah, the Sixers, Sixers rally. They play an injured Embiid. The healthiest team right now is Milwaukee. And their coach is dumb, and they are also – yeah, they're just one of the dumbest teams I've ever seen. I mean, there's not really much to add on, on that, but <laughs> I think that you'd probably agree that Phoenix in most, most years would be dead to rights without Chris Paul, but because the rest of the league is kind of weak right now, they still might have a shot. Is that fair to say? Yeah. Yeah, that sounds, that sounds about right. Like if the Lakers were still alive in the Western Conference, Phoenix could just pack their bags. Like, fully healthy. Like, fully healthy Lakers, Western Conference Finals, like, we'll see you, whatever. Phoenix is not going to win that without Chris Paul. But against the injured Clippers or the injured Jazz, I think they got a shot. Right. Yeah, I'm with you. All right. Well, we'll, uh, we'll see how that goes. It's been 
it's been some interesting series so far. So, Scott, today it's a pretty exciting day. U.S. Open starts. Are you uh, are you psyched? Yeah, I love tennis. Oh, oh, you mean golf? Oh, you mean yeah, Tory Pines? Other, my other favorite sport. Uh yeah, I'm th- I'm thrilled. Now I'll follow it a little bit. I can't say that I'm that invested in golf tournaments without Tiger being involved. Just fully honest, but I still follow it to some degree. So, do you have any thoughts? I'll let you go first. I do. I do. I do have some. Th- I do have some thoughts. I like to. I like to bet golf. I like to bet golf, especially in the majors. But we had to do that for a couple of weeks there during the pandemic. That was that was quite a time, Scott. When we were doing our sh- daily show covering MMA, NASCAR, and golf. I remember we had a little bit of soccer there for a little bit. A little bit, a little bit of soccer, a little bit of soccer from Europe. We had we had Valdis on a couple of times talking about Bundesliga and and that, and that kind of stuff. So I still miss the NASCAR show, but that's just me. It was a good time. It was a great time. It, it was a very very good time. So. So Scott, some of the favorites. John Rahm is the uh, is pretty much the betting favorite right here, plus plus ten fifty. Uh, Bryson DeChambeau, just Dustin Johnson are both fifteen hundred. Xander uh, Xander Shoffley is also fifteen hundred. Brooks Kepka, Bryson DeChambeau's arch nemesis. He is. They're plus not. 80. They're not partnered together. What a. They're shame. not partnered together. Uh, Spieth nineteen hundred. Rory twenty one, and then it goes up from there. So. Any of those uh, any of those guys get you excited? Well, I got to start off with the favorite here uh, with Rom. Of course, he was cruising in the memorial, and then he had the positive COVID test. <laughs> Speaking of COVID, midway through the third round, when he was up, I believe it was seven shots, eight shots at the time. So, did he make an appearance? Did Did we get him on call the cops for that? Uh, we mentioned it. I know that. It was a very interesting situation because FanDuel and DraftKings paid out the betters as winners. So they got like a courtesy win. Nice. But in most situations, we had that included because some books didn't refund. Let me tell you something. Coming from the background, the casino background, those are, those are easy decisions to make. Give them their money. And you know why, Scott? Because they'll come back and bet more of it next time. They're going to give it back. That's the, the only thing I know is if you're up eight shots in a golf tournament and your name's not Greg Norman, you're probably going to win the tournament. Easy. I, I Listen, I love the shark, but he's a, he's a part of some all-time collapses. I think I think you'd agree with that. I love the hat. I love the shark logo. But we can agree on that point. I love the shark logo. What? He always wore the shark logo t shirt. That's all you kids know. He has a, he has the hat. He has the logo. You never did you ever see him play a round of golf ever? I have uh, somewhat, but of course he was peaking before I was born. So that's what I'm that's what I'm saying. That's you you smart ass kids. Oh, I was a good Greg Norman does joke. I didn't say that. I know he was a top two golfer in the world at one point, but. When it comes to what he's going to be remembered for, it's for blowing that huge, what is it? What was he up eight in the Masters going into That the- is not what he's going to be remembered for, Scott. I think it is. I think Greg Norman is a top 10 all-time golfer, PGA Hall of Famer. That's fair. And I think the first thing that if you asked anybody what they would think of would be the choke job at the Masters. Well, you just asked somebody and he said no. That's because you're trying to be kind to him. I'm trying to be even I didn't handy. say Norman was bad. That's not the point. Anyway. Ron was going to win that tournament. That's, That's the point I'm trying to make. The shark logo. He had a nice hat. What do you, what do you want from me? But so you want to you play Rom or not? I do. Uh, okay. I like Rom. I do question potentially any side effects from COVID. Uh, you have to keep in mind if he was asymptomatic or symptomatic. But he was dialed in. He looked very good in the memorial. And historically speaking at Torrey Pines, he has been very good. So the, tra- the course history is there. I think that he'll do well once again. As for the other guys... I want nothing to do with Kepka. I thought Kepka was back when he almost beat Phil in the last big tournament that they were in together. And then he missed the cut in his last tournament. He was awful. So Kepka, you never know with the injury. Uh, I don't really think that he's worth that price. I know by name it sounds good, but with the current knee issues and the uncertainty, it's probably be closer to 30 to one. I don't really see 17 to one there. What do you you know, I don't. I don't know that that's a that that's a friendly course for a lot of these guys. It's, it's it's long, and of course it's a U.S. Open, so it's going to be unforgiving. So length pays off, but not to not to mention some of the wind that might play a factor in that one. Always true. Always true. So for that reason, I don't know. You know, I'd be tempted by the big boppers like you know DeChambeau at at fifteen hundred, but 
I don't know that he has played well lately. Yeah, and I don't know that he has the accuracy to stay out to stay stay out of the trouble uh, when he loses loses the ball to the to the right off the fairway. So yeah, so I like Rom. As for the other ones, Dustin Johnson, I'm tempted by. I know he struggled a little bit over the weekend last week, but as a whole, I thought he was pretty good. Plus, you know, Dustin Johnson, historically speaking, in the U.S. Open, he's very good. That's not a that's not a surprise. He's one of the best golfers on the planet. So. I think getting him at 17 to one is more appealing than DeChambeau based on current form. I, Shoffley I like as a golfer, but he seems to always fall apart on Sundays whenever he's in the hunt. So I don't really want anything to do with him. Uh, Rory, no. Thomas, no. If I'm looking at anybody else, I do like Patrick Reed at 29 to one. I know we mentioned fairways and he's not exactly the greatest at hitting on the fairways, but he's very, very good at scrambling, which has been kind of his MO his entire career. So if you can't really avoid the trouble, or if the wind's so bad, everyone's in trouble. Give me someone who's good out of the rough. And I think you'd agree that Patty Reed is one of the best scramblers on the entire tour. Yeah, he, and he's, he's good at the U.S. Open. He's top 15 four of his last six times. So he's, got to, he's, he's not one of the bombers, but he's got to have that short game. And he does have the short game if he's dialed in. So, yeah, you could, you could certainly make, it, make a case for that. Now, I know that you kind of poo-pooed. You, you just kind of went past – Rory, and can you can you tell me why? Well, Rory had the win, which really seemed to come out of nowhere uh, a couple of weeks ago. But other right, than the, that, at the Wells Fargo at the beginning of May, right? Yeah, but other than that, though, has he had any good results of any kind? He didn't play. He didn't play well at the PGA, um, but he uh, he's really hitting his approach shots well. And it's a major championship. It's Rory. You know, I think he's always worth a sniff. Uh, that that's fair. I just think nineteen to one is just. Not doesn't really seem like he's priced correctly in the situation. Like, do oh, I think he should be priced above Morikawa and Spieth right now? Even Hovland, probably not. He I, plays I Tory Pines very well, buddy. He's got two top five finishes and three starts there. And he's that's the thing top, is, I also don't know. All three times, I have a hard time in golf when it comes to comparing historical, I'd say, results to modern form because the Rory we see now is nowhere near the Rory that we've seen in the past. I understand, but John John Rahm has also been very successful at Torrey Pines, so you're gonna. Yeah, and he's also been good lately, so that's why he's favored in the event. That's why I like him. But I really went out of limb there and said I like John Rahm to uh, do well here. I'm tempted by Zalatoris uh, at 40, 41 to one on Fanduel, youngster, but he's been very good. I mean, there's really nothing else to say about Zalatoris. He's just been a really steady, solid golfer. You have anything else you want to add about him? Because I feel like I feel like that kind of sums him up perfectly. No, I think that's and you're getting a good price. You know, I'll tell you, there's another a sleeper that I like is Jason Cockrack. I was actually going to say Cockrack is another. Gotcha. Guy I'm tempted by. Yeah. Uh, We're and, on the same page on that one. I've got him. At, I've got him at seventy to one. That's what uh, I see. I just think I just think there's a good value. He, uh, you know, again, not a, not a guy that's a household name yet, but somebody that's been playing some pretty good golf at the end of last year, being playing good golf this year for the most part. Uh, again, he's a guy that probably should be you know, 35 to one, 40 to one, something like that. But getting him at 70, I think is a good price. Yeah. He's a guy who you'll know should make the cut and you're assuming he'll be on one of the, I'd say the first page of the leaderboards some point in day three. Yep. I would agree with that. So yeah, take your shots. All right. Very good. So we'll, we'll be talking about that as it progresses, but Scott, let's kind of shift gears here a little bit. Quick reminder, once again, everybody, you are listening to Winners and Winers Radio. Give us an hour. We'll give you the winners. And, of course, brought to you by winnersandwiners.com, the number one site in the world for predictive sports analysis. Make sure you stop by there and check out the latest information on the line movements, the weather, injuries, all those things that may affect how you make your play. So winnersandwiners.com, full predictions and previews into every game, every single day, and it is always so get over there and check that out. Okay, Scott. Now, this is a game that has kind of a personal meaning for both of us. This is our favorite hockey team involved here tonight as series shifts back to the island. Are you going? You going to this one? I'm in such a tough spot where I could go, but I also want to watch the Nets game because I have two teams on at the exact same time in the playoffs. Got a phone that's what I'm saying. Do I really want to watch a Nets game on a phone while I'm at a hockey game? No. So I might, I might go. I'm still pondering. <sighs> I, know, I know I'm running out of time, but I really, really want to do like a picture-in-picture picture and watch both the games at the same time. 
Okay, well, let's... Or go to a sports bar and watch both at the same time. There you go. There you go. Go to a sports bar with giant giant screens. Watch two games at once. What more can you want? So the Lightning and Road Team, Scott, they open at minus 137. A little bit of Lightning money coming in. That line's starting to creep up at 140, 145, somewhere in that neck of the woods. Five. The Islanders have really been underdogs in every single game of the playoffs. (laughs) Every game. They have, haven't they? Yeah. All right. And it's gone okay for them. Uh, yeah, they're still alive. So that's they're a good still thing. alive. They're still they're they're one of the eight teams still playing, Scott. Yep. So what are you gonna do? Uh, no, four we're, teams, we're, right? We're, yeah. yeah. You mean four? Yeah, we're down to four. We got the we're the the, the frozen four. Yeah, we're in the semi finals. Thank you very much. So I always I always begrudgingly pick against them, and it's a win win for you. Either Tampa wins and you look like a genius, or the Islanders win and never in doubt. You watch these teams play. Tampa looks so much better. Of course, I thought Boston looked better than the Islanders. For the really. Island, Boston looked way better than the Islanders. They out, they just outshot them. What every game? You can argue Pittsburgh was too, because if Jari sure. was even halfway decent, they put them in there. Decent. Yeah, absolutely. So now you've got a team that arguably has the best goalie in the business. They're going against the Islanders. Islanders are found. You know, I'm I'm tired of picking against them, Scott. You know, for the for the sake of you, for the sake of for you going to the game and us cheering on our team, I feel like I'm almost obligated to take the lightning here because that's worked out most times in the past. But you know, I at the end of the day, I think there's decent value on taking a spin with the Islanders here. I think that's I think, fair. I think you're going to. I think that price is going to get better as the day goes on. Yeah, it will. If you like the Islanders, I would wait till right before opening puck drop because yes. we're just going to see more Tampa money. But looking at this spot, the Islanders in game three of the first two series, because they were the road team for games one and two in both, they lost game three. So they, were, I believe they lost game three to Boston as well as Pittsburgh. Is that right? I think they did. Yes, that sounds right. Yeah, I think they were down 2-1 in both series and then ended up rallying. But the point is, is that they've been splitting at home uh, in the past, which isn't a surprise because it's hockey. So home ice sounds cool, but if your goalie has even one bad misplay, everything goes out the window. So I think Tampa's the better team. They'll get more shots on net. We know that. Barlamov did look good last game. They gave up four goals, but you can agree that Barlamov was fine. It was just Tampa's a little bit too fast for this team. but. You think I am we're looking, going to get slower. What do you? I'm what are you hanging your head? The Islanders ended up winning. Uh, no, they lost Game Three against Boston and against Pittsburgh. So I was right. So the first home game of the series has not been too kind to the Islanders in this postseason run. I think Tampa probably wins this game. I actually think it's a good price at around minus one forty. I mean, you look at the teams and what they were laying at home. It's about a sixty cent disparity from what they were laying in Game Two to Game Three. Home ice advantage is not worth sixty points in, in not in sixty points at hockey. What are you kidding me? Sixty cents? No, I don't think I don't think it is either. Sorry, sixty points, sixty cents. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, that, so that's that's conversely that's the, that's our other piece of advice that we would give you if you want to bet the lightning. Hopefully, hopefully by the time you hear our show, you've already got that bet made. I think if you want to go for a uh, maybe even better value, lightning and regulation. Yeah. You might lose an overtime in a close game, but if you agree that Tampa should have more scoring chances. And we know this Tampa Bay power play is a little bit better than the Islanders' power play. So if you have a couple more chances there, you should be able to get a couple across. And the Islanders, I mentioned in the last game, I like their team total under two. They had one and then scored the second one with four minutes to go, finished with exactly two. If you're only going to score two goals against Tampa in any given game, you're going to have a lot of problems. So I think there's value on Tampa in this spot. Okay. All right, very solid. Any thoughts on the on – the- on the total, keep riding uh, the under. Ah, uh, it's really, really tough because the empty netters are so crazy. If I was going to play it, I'd probably go first period under. Okay. All right, sir. Very good. And we've touched on it briefly, but we do have we do have the first chance to see how the team that gave a game away gets to respond as they come back home. That's the Milwaukee Bucks hosting the Brooklyn Nets. Scott, once again. Milwaukee, big favorite right here. Five and a half points across the board. That's where it opened. That's where it stands. It should be. 220 is your total. So what do we go off of here, Scott? That's the thing. Uh, I'm going to ask you 
first I'm part sure of the a game. Lot of people would agree that the Nets got lucky and that they probably should be down 3-2 right now. Now, Milwaukee at home has not lost against the Nets in the series. We know that game three was very close. It was hideous. It was 86-83. to Then game four was a bit of a rout. Uh, Kyrie got injured halfway through, of course. And then game five was the miraculous win by the Nets. But you might ask what I, how I think Milwaukee's going to play, and I don't trust this team at all because they take so many stupid three-pointers. I might ask that. Get yeah. any layup they want on any given possession. But I'm assuming Harden's still going to look very uncomfortable. Durant might be exhausted after playing 48 minutes. I love the Bucks' first half. I That's think it's hard. a great spot for Milwaukee to just lay it down in the first half. Are they going to choke? Maybe. But that's why I'm not taking the full game. If I get, in order to choke, you have to have a big lead. And I do think that help, that bodes well for the first half. But it's a spot. That is, that is solid logic right there, my friend. You can't choke without a lead. Yes. Patent pending by me. But anyway. Here's a shirt. Looking at the actual spot there, the crowd will be into it for Milwaukee. And the Nets, even though they won the game and now they're up 3-2, are we sure they're going to go all out in this game, knowing that Harden just played 46 minutes on a bad hamstring? I think only you doubt that, Scott. I do. And I, I think other people are with me on that. I don't, I'm not sure you're right there. I think these guys are professional athletes, and they're in the sixth game of the playoffs. Oh, no, no, I'm not saying they're going to go into the game trying to punt. I'm saying if things go bad early, do they maybe switch their focus a little bit to game seven? No. I think they might. No, that's not how any of this works. I think they might. That's not how it's supposed to work. I think that's how it might work. No. No. But no. Just saying. I, okay. I don't know what you think the odds are of the Nets winning in Milwaukee anyway, but do I think if it gets ugly early, Nash decides, you know, maybe rest these guys who just played an entire game and we'll get ready for game seven? I think that's a possibility. So you think the same coach that rode his star for all 48 minutes – and his injured second star for 46 minutes is all of a sudden going to say, you know what, guys, you need a rest. I think there's a huge difference between losing that home game and losing a game on the road you're supposed to lose. If they lose that home game, the series is over. They at least bought themselves a game seven. They bought themselves an extra three days where Kyrie maybe can come back. Maybe. He's not coming back. He's not coming back. I know he's not coming back. But I'm saying maybe. You can even argue Harden might be a little bit healthier two days from now. So at least they bought themselves extra time. I think that's the difference between the two situations. Okay. Um, But I like the Bucs first half. Like the Bucs first half there? What do you think of that play? I don't hate it. Uh, You got a number on it? Somewhere around four? four Three and a half. Three and a half? We, We saw Harden. He couldn't hit anything if he fell out of a boat. And Durant might be very good, but... First half, Milwaukee, very good. Second half, Milwaukee, very bad. I'll skip the second half part. Here's the thing. Do they make – does the bud make any kind of changes, Scott? Do they send Giannis right at Harden? Can they get him to drive on Harden, for God's sakes? That's what I said. I said they should use Giannis as a screener on Harden's guy and then just when they switch because the Nets switch everything, just give it back to Giannis. (laughs) I I feel like that's all you need to do, but that's – I feel like the main issue they ran into was they kept Lopez in for too long. He couldn't guard anybody, and they just threw him out there for the entire fourth quarter to get killed. I think that's the adjustment. I think you go smaller, you play Portis more minutes. Does, does Harden – I mean, obviously, Scott, he was mainly there as a decoy last time. Was that worth it? Was that worth 46 minutes? Why do you keep him up 46 minutes? See, I don't think it was worth it, but Durant post game said it was huge. So it could have been a mental thing for them. It gave them a sign of, I'd say, life because you had another guy besides Durant who's been an MVP in the league. So maybe mentally it meant something from the actual performance perspective. It was one of the worst games of his career. But I can't blame Harden for it. He played 46 minutes on one hamstring. No, nobody's no, nobody's blaming him. No, but I'm saying if you go just by stats, it was not worth it. But according to Durant, it – had a huge moral lift for the locker room. Okay. Well, that's, that's great. But could you, could you have got that same lift at 36 minutes, 35 minutes? That's my point. I just, why do you? It was dangerous. I loved it by Nash. I was a huge fan of it. At the end of the day, 
he, it can go either way. You can either win the game and Durant drops 49, or you can leave great, uh, you can leave Pedro in in the eighth inning to blow the lead in game seven. Like, there well, are a couple of ways to ride with your best player. But Nash looked at the situation and said, I need you two guys, even if Harden can a shot, I need both of you to carry this team. I'm going to let, I'm going to let America in on a little secret right here. Okay. Anybody that tells you that they know exactly how this game is going to end up, they know this team is going to, they are absolutely out of their minds. That's why I'm but going for the first half. Te- that, I think that's a playable, I think that's a playable play. I'm just trying to limit the variance. That's all I'm trying to do. Right. Right. I think the, I think the first half has a lot better chance to go according to script than the entire game because yep. these two teams, they have been psycho in this series. Anybody that tells you I got a beat on them, I got a hundred percent. They are absolutely, they're lying more than they usually are. All right. Run away from that person. If you, if you want to take a little play and you've got a feeling you want to make a play on this game, go right ahead. But I don't have a strong play to recommend that you should invest 3%, 5% of your bankroll in on this game. I, I think if you like the Nets to win hypothetically, just take Durant over 39 and a half points instead. Like he needs to go for 40 if they want to win. I will tell you this. I have a player prop that, I, that I've got on my play of the day that if you guys are on, the, on YouTube, check that out because it's, it's one of my favorites. And I think I'm hoping you're trolling and you just have uh, – I think I know what it is, but I'm not going to spoil it. I don't, I don't think you know what it is. A part of me hopes it's Harden under just to embrace the trolling. It's not. I could, there was no numbers on Harden when I checked. I would have considered the under if there were numbers. I know. Uh, I know. That would have been cruel. Hey, any thoughts on the total, Scott, 220? I'll go under. I know the game went over in the last time, but Durant at 49. I, I got to assume that Jeff Green does not go for 27 again. I think Harden will be that bad again. So I'll go with the under. Yeah, I think he'll – I think yeah. – I'm just not sure. You know, normally you'd say, well, he'd be better two days later, but – He has no lift. When you, when, you, when, you, when you hammer on it for, what, 46 minutes? Yep. Uh, that, doesn't, that doesn't help the healing process at all. Yep. So – all right, sir. So there you go. It'll be, it'll be a fun game to watch. I know uh, all of America will be tuning in. Well, at least the basketball fans will be. So, all right, Scott, moving on to the major leagues. Again, it is, it is getaway day. There are a, uh, a couple of day games, not as many, not as many as today. A lot of, it, was a big win, it was a big Wednesday getaway here for today. Shout out to you, Arizona. 22 straight road losses. Shout out to you. Uh, I will toot my horn a little bit, although, you know, fading Arizona, not exactly reinventing the wheel here, but we did have the Arizona run line on the premium side. So that was a nice, nice, easy win. And that one just about made call the call or made, made uh, the rocking chair wins because it was a very, very easy one. So what do you got here you like in the major, Scott? Anything stand out to you? Well, you got to look at Woodruff, of course, facing off against Colorado. Colorado did sweep San Diego, so props to them. But Woodruff against Marquez – Marquez was good in his last outing, but as a whole, pretty inconsistent. We know Woodruff is fantastic. Now, maybe struggles in Coors Field in the spot, but minus 155, minus 160 with Woodruff on the mound, I have to be tempted by that. you have any interest in playing the run line there, or do you just have no confidence in that Milwaukee offense? I have no confidence in that. Even at Coors. I would just take the money one. Okay. Uh, Yeah, that's – Woodruff is – Woodruff is really good. And, you know, any other year, he would be getting so much more press. Lance Lynn would be getting so much more press. But when you've got a guy with a, what, five, five, six ERA or whatever it is in DeGrom, he's getting, he's getting all the pub. As well, if DeGrom's going to be out for maybe a month or two, Woodruff might be the favorite to win the Cy Young. Get that Cy Young bet in there, buddy. Get that I, I'll go quickly on one more. Uh, right. I see Gant at around plus 170 or so against Morton. Atlanta just lost a couple games in a row to Boston. I know St. Louis isn't good, but there's no way that Atlanta should be laying 185 in that spot. That's a value play. That's a pure value play. And if you wanted to go back to the well with San Francisco, they've got their ace on the mound, Kevin Gausman on the mound, another guy that would be getting a ton of pub award for Jacob deGrom. Uh, You're going to catch them somewhere close to even money on the run lot over Zach Gowan in Arizona, who will be going for a record-breaking 23rd road loss in a row. Don't blow it, San Francisco. Don't, don't do it. Don't do it. Anything else? Other than that, uh, no. Maybe Miley plus money, but that's solely just fading San Diego right now. Yeah, and Mus- Musgrove, it's a, they, that's, not a, that's not a bad spin right there, this Cincinnati team, although they are 
certainly a lot worse away from home than they are in the friendly confines. So other than that, there's one more game, but I believe we're saving that for our final segment. Let's do it. You know, it is time for our final segment as we get ready to wrap up the Thursday show. You guys have hung with us. We appreciate it. And you will be rewarded mightily as Scott and I have put our heads together, come up with the very best play, the one that we like the best. If you had to put all your chips in the middle, if you had to put it all on just one game, this is your play, folks. It is time once again for Bet the Farm. They didn't want to get out of there today, Scott. They were they were a little slow. They were a little slow coming down the ramp. So sorry about that, guys. Yeah. Scott, it is it is a baseball play that we're going to roll with for Bet the Farm today, and it is your Tampa Bay Rays on the five inning run line. Of course, uh, you don't know what five inning run line is. Normally, it's a one and a half or five innings. It is minus a half of run. So basically, the Rays just need to be ahead by any amount after five. Rich Hill. The reinvented Rich Hill is on the mound. And actually, he's been very good. He was very good with Minnesota last year. 3-3-8 ERA this season, 102 whip. In his last nine starts, Scott, he has really bared down. He's been much better with a 1.61 ERA and a .84 whip. Uh, for the Mariners is who their opposition will be. It is going to be done on the mound. Thank goodness we got all of our airplane jokes out earlier, Scott. We, we don't have to go through the whole over under done thing that we did during the rehearsal. But Dunn's on the mound for the Mariners. He's not terrible. 391 ERA, but a 134 whip. That's not ideal. The Mariners, they do not do well for him. They have lost four of his last five starts. Scott, check it by at least five runs. And this is a Tampa Bay team that has been nails on the road playing 667 baseball as they have, as they have won 24 of their 36 road contest scott that is our favorite play of the day it is time to bet the farm get the haymakers out for the tampa bay rays first five run line minus 110 at minus a half a run you mentioned hills era of 1.61 i'm not sure if you mentioned that, that was over his last nine starts or not but the point is he has been great for about the last month two months or so and seattle got killed by minnesota uh, yesterday. I know that this team has been better than advertised, I'd say, because going to the year we thought they'd be terrible. They're not good. They're below 500 for a reason. And as far as the Rays go, any surprises there of how well they've done this season? I think the surprise has been the pitching staff because they got rid of Morton, they got rid of Snell, and it turns out both of them, Morton's kind of picked it up a little bit, but Snell got shelled again yesterday. Yeah, apparently the Rich Hill experiment, which I was questioning at the time, now we're betting on him. So it has gone pretty well for Tampa. They're kind of, they're kind of like the New England Patriots in that they unload the guys at the maximum point of their value. So yeah, congratulations to the Rays on another great season. And we hope you hit the first five run line here today. And that's going to do it for us, everybody. That is the Thursday edition in the books of Winners and Winers Radio. We appreciate you stopping by, whether you're on the YouTube or whether you're tuning us in on the radio dial. Thanks for joining us. Don't forget to tell your friends we do it every day here for myself, for Scott Reichel, for the rest of us. We wish you nothing but the best of luck today. Hope every ticket turns into cash for you. You guys take care, and we'll see you tomorrow.